Ladies and gentlemen, the next session, What's Driving Incivility? Traditional and Social Media's Impact, is sponsored by DTE Energy Foundation. Please welcome the editorial page editor for the Detroit News, Nolan Finley, and host for the Detroit Public Television and WDET 101.9 FM, Stephen Henderson. Am I on the left and you're on the right? Is that's, that the, that's the way that's, it should be. Or it depends which <laughs> way you're looking. Which way you're looking, yes. right? <laughs> well, Steve, in the, uh, when we were in the green room getting mic'd up and ready for this session, our friend and colleague, Krista McDonald, asked, how did you two become Detroit's odd couple anyway? <laughs> and uh, I didn't really remember. I knew it had something to do with booze. It did. But you had a whole lot better <laughs> memory of it than I did. Oh, no, I did. I remember exactly what it was. When I came back to Detroit from the East Coast in 2007, one of the first things I uh, did, one of the first uh, events I attended was the Republican conference on, on Mackinac where lots of the media have to go up and, and see all the emerging Republican candidates and stars and things. And uh, I was milling around uh, and Nolan came up to me and said, hey, aren't you the new guy at the Free Press? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, hey, let's, let's, go, let's go talk. Let's go have a drink. Uh, and of course, one drink turned into five turned into 15 turned into 5, whatever uh, and the rest was was history so. yeah and then two years later we were back up there was it two years or i think it was years? i think it was two years, two years we were back up there and we were in a, a bar and there were all these republicans and steve's in there and everybody's sort of looking at him you know <laughs> where a little scant <laughs> yes and, and there were two, these two women in the bar come up and asked me um how how can you be friends with steve Henderson, we hate him. And I said, well, how do you know you hate him? Have you ever talked to him? Have you ever taken any time to a visit with him, ask him questions? No, we just hate him. I said, well, he's standing over there. Why don't you go talk to him? <laughs> Two hours later. <laughs> it was the four of us for the rest of the night, right? <laughs> so, yeah. and, you know, that's, uh, Steve leads us to, you know, we did a little exercise this past summer for the NPR story course, yeah. where we sat down and talked about how people uh, come to their opinions and how, how their experiences, their backgrounds, uh, the way they've lived their life, shape their opinions yeah. and their viewpoints. And that was a very valuable discussion for me and it's for you, but we hope also to the li listeners because you know it, it sort of put in words what we've always known, that people who come from vastly different places, if they take the time to get to know each other, uh, can find out that their, their differences can make them very interesting to each other. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I say all the time that uh, one of the things that I feel like keeps me honest, in fact, is uh, the relationship I have with Nolan. It's, it's understanding that there's somebody else who, uh, whose ideas I respect whose ideas I understand and whose uh, point of view I can I can place I can place value in without having to to say that uh, it's the way I think or that I think he's even right. I mean, most of the time I think Nolan is wrong. Most of the time I think Nolan is very wrong, and I know he sometimes thinks, I am. <laughs> that's right, and I know he thinks the same <laughs> about me. Uh, but it is it is the fact that we understand each other. Uh, and understand where those points of view come from uh, that allows us, I think, to build beyond those differences, right? So the entire relationship is not just about what we disagree on. It's also about the things that we can do together and the, and the places where we can come together. Uh, Nolan and I have hosted for several years now uh, a social event, uh, a bourbon club, where we invite people from all over the political spectrum, all over the region, all over the state, to come and drink bourbon with us, which is one of our favorite activities, uh, but also something other people enjoy. Uh, and, and the idea is that even though we disagree, even though a lot of the folks at those parties vehemently disagree with one another, there's nothing wrong with coming together to hear someone speak, 
to talk with someone who doesn't think like you, yeah. to really think about why you believe the things that you believe and understand why somebody else believes the things that they believe uh, and be able to say, it's cool, uh, we're not gonna agree but I don't have to disrespect you for that, uh, and I don't have to expect that you'll disrespect me. And what you find in that process is, I mean, you go in assuming that the people who are polar opposite from you in their opinions, that something's wrong with them, that uh, they're, they're bad people, or, or not, not as bright as they should be, or just totally uninformed. And what you find out when you start talking to people about how they come to think the way they do is that everybody comes to their opinions through the same process. You know, they weigh the information, they honestly assess it, and they apply their own experiences, their own backgrounds, and they form an opinion. Yeah. And they're not necessarily wrong, they're just different from you. And I try to approach, you know, from the beginning in this job of editorial page ed editor and, you know, being paid to form opinions, mm -hmm. I've always approached this Opin, you know, this opinion for me with the idea that I may be wrong. And you don't know that unless you're willing to listen to somebody who has a different opinion yeah. and honestly assess the merits of their, of their points. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I think is really important for the civility conversation right now is trying to, to let people or get people to understand that civility doesn't mean giving up. No. It doesn't mean giving ground necessarily even. It doesn't mean saying that the things I believe are somehow uh, lesser than what somebody else believes or less worthy of respect uh, than what someone else believes. And it's also important to put that in historical context. I mean, think of uh, the ways in which uh, people of color in particular in this society, women in this society, have been told, have been told that civility sometimes must mean that you have to be quiet while someone else is talking, or that you have to accept, accept someone else's aggression uh, in the face of the things that, you, uh, that you're saying. Civility doesn't ask you to do that. Civility doesn't say that that's okay. What civility says is that we all have to be able to say what we believe, uh, respect what the other person on the other side of the table or the bar or wherever you are, is saying and not back down and not feel as though you are lesser or they are lesser. It is, uh, I think, an instrument of equality uh, that is available in a society that hasn't always embraced that equality. It's one of the other things that I think is really important about the civility conversation. But it does require you to listen. I mean, it's not all about talking. Uh, it does require you, you to listen and to keep an open mind, mm -hmm. and to approach the conversation with the idea that you just might learn something. I don't think in all our time that I've ever convinced you of the error of your ways on any <laughs> issue. But Me neither. <laughs> we've had good conversations yeah. and good back and forth discussion, and that you know, is the other point. You don't have to win. Right. You don't have to walk away thinking, I changed that person. I convinced him or her that they're dead wrong and I'm dead right. It's enough to know that you've been listened to and that you've listened. And later on, as you're, as you're considering things, you say, well, you know, that was a valid point. It doesn't change my mind, right. but it informs and broadens my own viewpoints. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, in a little bit, we're gonna be joined by some other folks who we're gonna talk a little more about the current climate and social media. Uh, and the way that they influence this, this narrative around civility. But before we do that, I, I want you and I, Nolan, to talk a little about um, how things have changed. Oh my. Uh, so like I said, I came back to Detroit in 2007 uh, after some time away, uh, and uh, over 10 years, Nolan and I have sort of carved out this, this yin and yang space uh, that, that we both coexist in and, and appreciate uh, each other's existence in. But the way in which the world reacts to us, the way in which the world reacts to us as individuals, uh, as, as people who can get along, has really 
really changed in the last couple of years. And I want to say in the last three or four years, it has looked different. Um, but the, the level of incivility, yes. the intensity of that incivility, and the sort of uh, the ease with which uh, anonymity, I guess, helps enable that incivility is really, really difficult. Um, it's really difficult to deal with. And, and I got to say, in my career, which spans now 20, 25 or 26 years, I don't know that I've had another period that looked quite like this. No, and it's easy to blame it on social media and the internet, and I think those are great enablers. But I also think that something's changed about us as a people, as a culture, as a society, that we are more aggressively uncivil and more assertively um, assertive in wanting to have our ideas prevail over someone else's ideas. I'm 42 years in this business. Uh, and so a little more than me. A little bit. <laughs> um, I'm 42 years here, and I remember when people sat down at typewriters to communicate with the newspaper. We used to get letters to the editor that were typewritten, and there was something, or handwritten, and there was something about that process, I think, that slowed people down when you actually had to type out or write out a letter and then fold it up and put it in an envelope and send it out. There was something about that process that's, that may cause people to remember their manners. And, you know, they express passionate opinions often, and, and they, would, they would tell you how you had wronged them or how you were wrong in your views, but it wasn't as hateful as it is now. And now it's not uncommon uh, for me to open up my email or, or, or my text messages and have the most vile, vile expressions from somebody who is convinced they hate me and that I'm a monster and it's okay to call me every name in the book simply because they disagree with my opinion. Yeah. That's a change. Yeah. That is a change and that's where we are, I think, in terms of civility, and it is much easier to do so. Something about the internet makes people forget their manners, makes them forget everything they learned in Sunday school. Yeah. You know, it just, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it turns them into people that you really, you know, you really wouldn't want to be around. Yeah, or in some cases that you fear. I mean, the number yeah. of threats oh, yes. uh, over the last three or four years uh, has also gotten out of control and, and increased a lot. Uh, Nolan mentioned it earlier, but, but I want to go back to it. Uh, last summer we did sit down and do a StoryCorps episode together. And for those who are unfamiliar with it, this is a, a podcast of sorts sponsored in part by NPR. Uh, they travel the country in a, in a little trailer with a studio inside, and you can go on and uh, tell stories with whomever you want to. Uh, I chose Nolan. Uh, to go with me into the story core trailer because I wanted us to take a step back from that sort of frenetic world we live in where everyone can uh, can fire off an email in an instant or pick up the phone and scream into it and, and hang up uh, and I wanted us to, to sort of experience that long form discussion now we know each other 10 years uh, I'm not sure we'd ever had that kind yeah. of discussion before, and it was important to do that it could, because it helped both of us uh, explain to the other one why we think what we think, uh, but then also to hear from the other one why that person thinks what they think. And we went all the way back to the beginning, you know, uh, childhood. Right. What, what were the things that, that helped shape who you are? What are the things that helped tell you that the way you see the world now is the right way? And one of the important things that came out of that, and I think we both knew this before, but it was really interesting to see it explicated this way, is that we really both want the same things. Yeah. Deep down, we have the same values. We want opportunity to be available to everyone. We want success to be something that's not determined by uh, the zip code that somebody lives in or uh, the status of their parents' marriage, for instance. Uh, we, want, we want things to work out. We see really, really different ways of getting to that place, and sometimes that brings us almost, uh, you know, it brings us to that brink of civility sometimes, that disagreement. But we always now, I think, can say, uh, deep down, we really are about the same things. And I think it takes 
stepping back from social media. I think it takes stepping back from uh, the, the sort of anger of now to be able to have a long form conversation to get there. And it's easy to assume you know someone. Mm -hmm. No matter, you know, you, we, like you said, we've known each other 10 years, but if you never stop and ask each other those sort of questions, you don't really know someone, you don't know what the motivators are. And what we found in that discussion, I mean, as hard as it might seem to believe, you know, you have a, you know, an urban kid, a uh, kid born in Appalachia, mm -hmm. you know, different backgrounds, different experiences, but the amount of things we had in common mm -hmm. throughout our, you know, both our childhoods and our adult lives. And I think you, uh, that you'll find, as you talk to people, you'll find common areas. And that's what we urge people to do at our bourbon nights, is just talk to folks and see what you have in common before you start discussing your differences. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're gonna be joined by some other folks who are gonna help expand this conversation a little.